Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Success After Trauma, where we bring on guests. They share their story, the challenges they've been through, what it's been like for them, and then what that aha moment was like and how they're serving back today. Today, we have a special guest, Shelly. Now, Shelly, real quick, Winter, I didn't ask, can you say your last name for me? I didn't ask, forgive me. No, you're good. Winter Boer. Winter Boer. Okay, that's where I was going to go, but I was also like... I've made some assumptions on last names before. Uh, mine's very weird. If if we, if we look at mine, if we pronounce it, we get a we get a sentence enhancer. But it's actually pronounced um, peas like the vegetable for my last name, a uh, unique one. So yeah. Shelly, bring on Shelly today. Shelly has a very unique story, and I'm going to allow her to share the details. But a very very unique upbringing. Um, I yes, um, you're going to be sharing a story that I will be hearing the this for the first time we hear about people that may have had uh, myself had physical abuse while other people have had physical abuse as a child and different overlays but this one was really really unique and then how you went through and created what you created today is really really powerful now everyone listening is like what kind of cryptic abstract information is he talking about Shelly would you introduce yourself and at whatever level you're comfortable, would you kind of take us back to your childhood and tell us what it was like for you growing up? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Shelly Winterboard. And first of all, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. This is wonderful. Um, okay. So my mom is an immigrant, was an illegal immigrant. She migrated from Austria and taught herself how to read English living in a car on the beach with my sister, my older sister. And um, so that's how she came to America. She worked in the film industry in LA. And um, yeah, then I was born. She had me, um, the story that she told me my whole life was that when she told the guy that she was pregnant, he left, he didn't want me, he didn't want to be a part of it. And so from the very beginning, that's what I believed about myself is that I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not wanted. And um, so, yeah, being a single parent is always a challenge. Uh, my mom happened to have a mental illness, which I actually don't know the diagnosis of what it was, um, but she had a mental illness that prevented her from creating consistency in her own life as well as as a parent. And so we, a lot of times in her business in Hollywood, it's feast or famine, but also with a mental illness, it is also feast or famine. So when there was feast, there was no saving. And so I calculated the other day, we had moved um, 15 times by the time I was 18. Mm -hmm. And so she would have a job and then it didn't go well. And then we would move because we couldn't pay rent. I remember coming home and everything we owned was on the front lawn of our neighbor's house because we're having a garage sale because we're moving in a couple weeks in the middle of the school year. And so there was a lot of inconsistency like that. And I remember thinking, I remember being six years old and my mom had a temper and she had said something really painful to me. I don't even remember what it was, but I remember at six years old thinking something's not right. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like I need a dad. And I, when I grew up, I don't want to say these things to my children. I don't want them to ever feel this way. And I, it's kind of sad because that's a young age to have that thought, six years old. Very but young. Um, I think from then I knew something felt confusing. It didn't feel safe for me. Um, so my mom was verbally abusive to my sister and I, she's my half sister, but we never say that we're like mm -hmm. <laughs> close. So, um, she was verbally abusive, physically abusive to my sister. And I think it got so bad with my sister that she kind of cooled it down for me. I didn't really experience physical abuse with her, but I think just the, there were a lot of lies. Um, there was a lot of manipulation in the way that like, even just my birth story, even to the day that I, the day I was born, like she told me I was born on Easter Sunday. And when I look back at the calendar in 82, it was, I was on Tuesday. 
So small things like that, that created false foundation for me mm-hmm. where I just, I didn't know where I fit. I didn't know who I was. Um, so in the eighties, my sister got mugged and my mom decided we're moving, but really her career started drying up in LA. So we moved to Spokane, Washington and lived there for a year, year and a half. Again, one of those nights moved in the middle of the night because we didn't pay rent um, and moved into this house. And my mom, she was home a lot, but when she was home, she wasn't available emotionally. And so even though I was around her, I didn't like, I don't ever remember her brushing my teeth or brushing my hair. I don't remember Mm -hmm. her tucking me in or reading stories. And maybe she did. I just don't remember it it's not a part of those core memories so anyway um when and even if i'm so sorry like even if she did like i'm sure that and and by the way i i your mother was going through what she was going through so let's let's give i care to give a lot of respect to her um at the same time how if it ever happened i'm sure it was so few and far in between how could you remember them I, I'm yeah. sorry. I just wanted to dive in. I'm so sorry for, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, wow. The, the, the depths of, you know, that I suggest to people again, I just like, man, you got excited here. Um, you know, like it's not okay to be physically abused. It's, it's not like, I don't remember the physical pain from a childhood. I can't forget the psychological pain. Right. And I can't imagine, um, keep going, forgive me. No, you're good. You're welcome to interject. It was, it was very confusing. I don't think I, it's not like you are six years old and somebody sits you down and they're like, now your mom has a mental illness. And sometimes the things she says, I know they're painful, but she, it's because she has a mental illness or that's why you're moving. Like nobody sits you down and tells you that you don't know. And so you're trying to figure it out and you're seeing that your friends are not going through the same thing. And so I enjoyed hanging out at friend's house because there wasn't yelling, there wasn't fear, it felt safer. Um, And again, I think through this whole story, as I share today, my mom did the best she could with what Mm -hmm. she had. Mm -hmm. I know that she loved me and she also wasn't able to care for me in the way that she needed because she wasn't able to care for herself. Correct. Um, so I honor my mom and love her. Um, she passed two years ago. And so, yes, I, I definitely, but it did make for a very confusing childhood. I felt very lonely and abandoned. Um, so we lived in Spokane for a year and she met a man and we moved to Wellfleet, Nebraska, a town of 60 people. So my 60, six zero. Six zero. I looked up the consensus the other Did day. Do they have a gas station or no? <laughs> no. No, you're like, no, no, not for no. 60 people. Get out of here. <laughs> the road, there was a lake, like a boating lake, fishing boat lake, and a post office. And, and a guy and a guy that sold produce out in his front yard, right? <laughs> not even. Not even. <laughs> not even. <laughs> but I really think that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, And I'll tell you why. So my sister, she was, I think, 13 when we moved to this town of 60. I feel so bad for her. She moved from LA in the 80s Mm. to this town of 60. It was harder for her. But for me, it was small town life, small town living. I developed a friendship with a girl across the street. She became my best friend. Their house was really fun. She had older brothers and a sister. And we just had a lot of fun. And down, down the road, a couple miles away, like my best friend and I, she lived two miles away in this town and we would take our binoculars and look at each other on the phone, the corded phone and like wave from our house to each other. We walk through the field and meet each other. But anyway, that's why I think that that was the best situation because I had some close friends there that I spent days and days with throughout the summer. And that's where I really saw, oh, my situation's different. And they weren't really allowed at my house because my mom was a smoker. And then with this marriage that she had, it became domestically violent on both ends. They both were violent with each other. Mm -hmm. So police at our house, breaking up the domestic. I remember one time I had a girlfriend (laughs) over and 
they started fighting and screaming and yelling and my mom's calling out to me for help and my girlfriend and I are in the closet hiding because we don't know what to do we're 10 yeah. years old we're terrified are they going to kill each other um and yeah there was just a lot of events like that with a lot of details um along with the mental illness came suicide attempts probably I mean probably a hundred over the span of my lifetime. But as a child, the message that I received was I'm not worth living for. Right. And so there was just such a wound in me. I'm abandoned. I'm not worth living for my dad left because he didn't want me, you know? And so I always dreamed that I could find him that if he could just meet me, he would love Mm -hmm, me. mm -hmm. Right. And so that was my childhood dream was finding this man that played Superman in some play. That's what Mm -hmm, I knew about mm -hmm. him. (laughs) -hmm. My mom was a seamstress. So um, teenage years, you know, I did the typical teenage thing, started partying, was really good at sports. um, And that's when I started, like, I was all of a sudden pretty and kind of became popular because of it. And then I was good at sports and I was a good student. And so the teachers really liked me. And for a while that worked really well in my high school until I started being bullied by this guy that ran the school and he wanted to date me. And I, you know, I grew up with all of them. I knew all of them. My class was 29 people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody really well from second grade Mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I knew I don't want to date this kid. And he, I walked in the lunchroom one day and he's like, Shelly's a slut. She slept with so-and-so. And And I was a virgin. I was like, what? And all the girls, they were like, oh, she's good at sports and she's pretty. Yep. Let's push her down. And the guys were like afraid of this kid. And so I just got bullied and had like no friends all of a sudden in school. Mm. And so my home life was very challenging. Um, with suicide attempts. I mean, I'd come home from school and my mom would be like, I took the bird and went to the mountains and we're never going to see you again. And so you're like home by yourself at 10 years old for the weekend, like not knowing if your mom's alive or dead. Um, And then I'm going to go back preteen. My mom went to LA to make some money once And she just left me with this man that was domestically violent with her. And I lived with him for weeks and weeks and weeks, months, actually. And I was a just preteen and wanted to go to all the sporting things. But there was this agreement that I had to ride the bus. So he would leave Monday through Friday, leave me by myself at the house, 10, 11 years old. And he would be gone Monday through Friday. And he would drop off, he'd come home on Friday night, and then he would take me and put me up on a roof, because he did, he was a handyman. And so I just remember this one roof, this pitch was incredibly, and I'm terrified of heights. Mm. And I'm working all weekend, hard labor. He buys groceries and puts it in a box, drops me off Sunday night, and says, you need to be on the bus every single day. Otherwise, the bus driver's going to call me and you'll be in trouble. And, you know, you're just like trying to make it, man. Can I just go to a volleyball game on Tuesday night? I mean, you're not even going to be here. Like the sun is setting and rising and I'm by myself. Nobody's here. Nobody knows that I'm staying by myself. I don't want to tell anybody because I know I'll get my mom in trouble and I just want her to come home. And so school ends, the school year finishes and she comes back and I told her, hey, I was by myself a lot. And I didn't like it. And so she moves me to my best friend's house and I live with them for the summer. It was the best summer ever. I, it was like four girls. They're so fun. We watched days of our lives every day, popsicles, like did all the stuff and just being a part of a family. And then in that time, my mom and this guy got divorced and she lied. She wanted him to go to prison. She did not, there was many things, but she lied and said that he had sexually assaulted me when he didn't. And then the court got involved and I had to go to therapy for something that didn't even happen. Mm -hmm. And my mom had written this statement from me. And so here I am in therapy for something that didn't happen. 
And I'm mm. terrified this man's going to come back and harm mm. us. Mm. So I didn't want to move back home. My mom's home, but I don't want to be there because he's coming for me because he knows I lied. Everybody knows I lied, right? Um, but my mom's doing this to try and get him in trouble. I can't imagine. I mean, the 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 layers of trauma that you know sitting in having to talk to someone about such an um graphic event i mean the blessing of it didn't happen but also jesus what is the like processing of it like hey let me tell me what happened you're like what people do this no not me what do you mean and you have to process it somehow with them i can't even imagine and the therapist just i didn't talk because i was like there's nothing to say it's not true (laughs) Yeah, well, how do you how do you like talk I, about it? Yeah, good. I didn't feel like I could tell him it wasn't true because that mm. would get my mom in trouble. Mm. And she was the only constant, is even though it wasn't constant, like mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. her mom. And so I'm not going to say anything. So every session, he's just like, "This is just going to take longer if you're not talking." And I would talk about a little bit, like he was probably I don't know there was one time that he pushed me around a bit but it was nothing it wasn't sexual assault but Mm -hmm. anyway that was wild so I think I was older at that point that was about I think they divorced when I was 13 14 so when I moved back in with my mom I was terrified I was terrified he was coming we didn't Mm -hmm. even have locks to our house it's a hundred year old house there's no locks like he's coming for me I'm sure of it and at the same time was being bullied at school. It's just ridiculous. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And wow. I, I was a good kid. I wasn't bad. Mm-hmm, Not that mm-hmm. there's bad or good kids, but like I wasn't getting right. in trouble. I wasn't sleeping around. I wasn't, you know, anyway. So mm-hmm. we uh, we lost that house and we ended up moving into this old church and my mom redid it. She was an incredible and in decor, like she could do anything. She she was a carpenter. She was a seamstress. She was an incredible chef. And she made this church really nice. And uh, my sister came back and lived with us for a while. She's seven years older than me, came back. And I was so glad to have her. We lived there about a year. And then my mom said she wanted to move to Colorado. So three weeks before my 16th birthday, We packed up and moved to Colorado where I knew no one. And we lived with these, this older couple and my mom quickly got a boyfriend and was gone and left me at these people's house that I didn't know. They judged my mom and me the whole time. And I didn't feel like I could be 16. So I started this relationship with this guy that I met. He sold me a pair of shoes at Foot Locker. Him and I became friends and he was my buddy. We just hung out. And um, in that time, my mom, like a few months after living with them, she got an apartment. This guy was paying for the boyfriend. They were together all the time. I never saw her. And one night she told me, hey, I want you to go and stay at Will's house. This was my boyfriend. He became my boyfriend, this guy. And she said, I want you to go and stay at his house. Now I'm 16 years old. What 16 year old's going to be like, oh no, I'm not going to go stay at my boyfriend's, right? Mm-hmm. So I went and stayed. And the next day I went to school and I came home for lunch and the door was ripped off our apartment. Like it was just gone. Mm. File cabinets tipped over. I The birds in my room, which never was, it was in a cage in my room. And I remember thinking like, I'm terrified to open my mom's room because I don't know what I'm going to see. Wow. I've been with my mom when she was mad at a neighbor. We got in the car with the shotgun. My mom's driving terribly and we're going to like harm this neighbor. I've been there in the fights. I've seen it. I don't know what I'm about to see when I open a door. And you can edit this out or you can leave it, but... I open the door and there's just a pool of blood in my mom's bed. And I, she wasn't there. I don't know where she is. So I call my sister who lived in another state. And I said, Hey, have you heard, you know, like, I don't know where mom is. What's happened. Is she okay? And my sister said, I just got a call. Mom's at the hospital. She tried to commit suicide. She's okay. 
And um, so I called her boyfriend and this, his son answered and he's like, yeah, your mom tried to commit suicide because my dad and her were fighting. So I go to the hospital or actually I call my boyfriend. He comes, picks me up. I don't want to go to the hospital because it's terrifying. Like it's just a really, I don't know, the hospital, you know, yeah. situation. I just didn't want to go. So I waited yeah. until my sister got in town six hours later. The worst part is we go, my boyfriend's like, let's go and watch a movie. That'll be good to keep your mind off of it. Well, at the time, Patch Adams and Dreams, it was another movie he did. They were in the theater around the same time. And we went not to Patch Adams. We went to the What Dreams May Come or something like that. And it was all about this woman trying to commit suicide. The entire movie. And I was just like, Whoa. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. So terrible. And I was 16. So I didn't have the like guts to walk out of the movie theater. I didn't have that like right, right. That self-empowerment where I was just like, I'm not staying for the movie. So I watched this whole damn movie. But anyway, um, so my sister gets there, I go to the hospital, and I'm I just think like I know there's been many attempts, but this was the closest one. This was the most traumatic one for me. And I just remember thinking, I'm done. You don't love me. You were willing to leave me here, like by myself. What are you doing? And her boyfriend told me, you know, this is your fault, right? To me. He said, you are never there for your mom. She needs you at home. I'm like, wait a second. You're telling me the person that never stays the night here because she She's always at your house that I've left her. I'm 16. She's the parent. Wow. And I remember knowing this is not right. That's not, there's no way. So my sister had just gotten married three weeks before and her and her husband, they said, come move back with us, move back to Nebraska with us and live with us. And I did. And so I left. My mom didn't want me to leave. I need you. There were lots of tears. It was a really hard conversation, but I was terrified of her. I didn't Mm, want to be in that situation anymore. And so I moved in with my sister, who, mind you, has also gone through a very similar experience as me and now is in a brand new marriage and is trying to figure it out and now Mm -hmm. has a 16-year-old sister that's never had a father figure. It was tough. It was a mm-hmm. tough two years for us. Um, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. I mean, good on, have, good on your sister for, for stepping yeah. up at that level and during that chapter. It was, um, it was the good, best thing for me. Sorry, go ahead. I was, well, I was also going to say good on you on having, you know, consciously, you know, just the way things, but what a blessing that you were able to have enough courage to, to face your mother. I mean, literally, I, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone, everyone listening, like my my mother died at a younger age. Nonetheless, I I say this to say, like, I couldn't imagine like having that bond. like the mother figure is like this very, you know, very important. I mean, father too. um, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, more connected to more attractive mother than have mother, you know, but the mother is like, you know, like, the female body feeds us as we're being nursed and created um, and to have to stand up to your mother and make that decision. And, and even when she is emotionally pulling against you, obviously in her trauma responses, uh, the courage that you had, um, and, and I, I have to make an assumption, but that decision was probably altered the trajectory forever in, in a positive way. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the courage you had as a child is, is, I I mean, questionably just a blessing. I mean, no one was there the whole time and, and everything's coming at you. And somehow you kept, you know, as the, as, as the water was rising, you kept figuring out how to, how to continue to tread. It's powerful. It is. It's incredible. And that's why I love the work I do because I know what Mm. it's like. I remember. And it's like, Mm. if I can do it, you can. Yes. You know, that's kind of my story. Like, 
yeah, we've all gone through our stuff, but we can make it and we can make it really well. And here's how, right? So yeah, it was, it was the last time I ever lived with my mom, 16 years old. Wow. Um, And you know, it's wild, Greg. Oh my gosh. So I moved back to this small town. I don't want to go back to the school I was in because I had been bullied. So I moved 10 miles away. We played them in sports. I knew everyone. The rumor was Shelly moved to uh, moved to Colorado because she was pregnant, had the baby, left the baby, and came back. So- <laughs> kids are kids are creative. <laughs> oh my and gosh! And of course, I wasn't telling people what was happening. Right, all. right, right. You're yeah. like, no, that's not what happened. They're like, what happened? Nothing. They're like, yeah, that's what happened. All right, moving along. <laughs> Oh my God. He's like, come on. Oh man. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm laughing at the creativity of the kid. Like as soon as you left, they put a story together, but, but you yeah. know, it's not funny. You know, you haven't have lived it, but yeah, a little yeah. bit of humor in them putting it together pretty quickly. Like yeah. here's, here's what's going on with Shelly. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Wild. Um, and the part of growing up in the Midwest too, is like, if you weren't born there, you're an outsider. Like, even if your mom moved there and you were born there, you're still the outsider because your grandfather wasn't born there. Yeah. And so like, we were just always the outsiders there. And then especially because everybody knew the place we were in our house all the time. And, you know, like, <laughs> so Anyway, I moved back in with my sister and it's crazy because she ended up marrying someone that um, I'm just for her sake and protection, like they made national news because of domestic violence. Like, mm. and so I saw that early on. She saw it early on. She lived in it for 18 years. Um, mm. It almost cost her her life five years ago. But yeah. so living with them was challenging in a different way because he was always kind of like before it became physical, it was emotional for sure. And so I was being told that I was a beggar um, and just a lot of things, like a lot of things that he would say to my sister and I, like, you're just like your mom. And for my sister and I, that was like, we love our mom and adore her, but we did not want her life. Right. Of course not. Of course and so not. that was not a compliment for us. It just brought a lot of fear. And so, mm. Here we are, senior year. I'm dating this new guy. I love him. His family's great. I love the church he's going to. I'm like, I think I can, I've seen enough now that I don't have to live the way I've grown up. Like, I think there's something different. I want it. I'm going to go for it. And so I, I took one ACT, didn't get an amazing score, but enough to get into a college. I applied to one college and I got in and I got loans. And I was like, I'm, I'm going. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I was so excited to make a name for myself. And like, nobody knows what happened in my home. And so I, I, uh, I'm going to scoot back first. So the summer that I graduated high school, I had been sharing with my volleyball coach about my home life. I had confided in her and my, she had told my track coach, small town, told my track coach, he's like, Hey, we need a nanny. Do you want to be a live-in nanny? I was like, yes, because things that my home with my sister and her husband, it was rough. And so I was like, yes, I came home. I was like, I've got a solution. I'm going to move out and this is going to be so great for us. And I thought it would like relieve pressure. And they were like, no, you can't move out. I'm like, wait a second. I'm 18. I can do what I want. And they're like, no, we'll, no curfew. You can do this and that just live at home. They just wanted me to stay home. And I was Mm -hmm. like, no, I'm not. So I moved out while they were at work. I moved everything of my stuff, 18 years old and moved in and was a live in nanny. <laughs> and it broke relationship with my sister and her husband, um, and which was unfortunate. It didn't stay that way, but, um, but that family, there was love there that I had never seen before. There was mm. fun, there was safety and security. And as I watched them parent, I felt like I was getting parented. Mm. And so um, magical. it was, it was incredible to just see what a healthy dynamic looks like. 
And I wanted that. And I was like, okay, this is what I want. So they moved me to college. My sister and I were estranged. My mom was still in Colorado doing her own thing. And so this family moved me to college and I started college and I loved it. It was so fun. There was just so many different people, so many more people that if this didn't work out, you know, if you didn't drive over here, you drive over here. And I just got a lot of friends. It was really fun. That's um, awesome. Yeah. I could imagine how cool that was to experience. Like I'm just, I'm, just, I'm literally imagining but like a small town, like there's, you know, there's, like that kid, he, he runs all 29, like his opinion, he had the strongest opinion. So everyone's like, yeah, Tom, you know, listen, Tom, then you go to college and they're like, yeah, there's Tom. And there's another group. It's like, ah, oh, fuck Tom, come over here. <laughs> like all these different groups. <laughs> exactly. You get to be whoever you want to be. And I wasn't the girl with the, with the police center house all the time. I wasn't yeah. the girl, you know, that slept around apparently, which I didn't, but right. that was the rumor. So um, and it worked out really well for the girls because they're like, yeah, push her down. <laughs> like she's taking oh, I can only I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I they loved it. that opportunity. They did. They did. And, you know, I mean, they're just doing the best they could too. So. Literally, literally. They, yeah. Literally. They were kids. Yeah. We're all <laughs> I mean, it's not, it it's never, the behavior is not a pro. I love that. That's so magic. You've heard, you said it a couple of times and obviously because you've done the work, um, love, love, love. They were doing the best they could with what they had at that time. I, I genuinely to my core believe that about everyone and inappropriate behaviors are never acceptable. Right. So we, exactly. we don't judge that. We don't judge that person, nor do we tolerate their behavior. Exactly. I'm and not I love judging that. them. I get it. And it wasn't right. Bingo. That is yeah. so powerful that, I mean, that's evidence of, of the work that you've done. Um, keep, keep, yeah, keep going. Yeah. So when I was 18, that's when I really started this quest of like, what is emotional health? I wasn't calling it that. I didn't know what it was called, but I mm. knew I wanted it. I knew that it was possible because I started to see it. And that is my desire. Mm. So I thought I want to be a counselor. And so I took all these classes in college and then I was like, eh, I think I'll bring, <laughs> I don't know if I could do this. And so I had these really fun, outgoing, self-confident friends that were in organizational communication. And I was like, that's it. And I took one class and the, the dean was incredible. He, the class was done by the dean. Um, and I just loved him and I switched my major and I got a degree in communication. And around the same time, I had an experience um, where I became a Christian hmm. and I just decided, Beautiful. yeah, I just decided like, okay, God loves me. I'm good. Let's do this. I'm going to share my story. And I started speaking at church. I, I like pounce into the, into the pastor of a church of like 4,000 people. I'd be like, Hey, can I tell you what God's doing in my life? He's like, yeah. Hey, will you share on Sunday? And I would just share my story on Sunday morning in front of thousands of people. I've got this degree that's teaching me how to formulate my thoughts. And, and so I fell in love with speaking and I knew mm. I have a story to tell a story of hope, like bad stuff happens in so life powerful. and we can make it. And here's how. And that so, is so powerful. It is. It was like, I was training to, to be the mouthpiece for my own life, for my own story. I just kind of fell into it and it just, it's just so perfect. So yeah, I met some really great solid friends that loved me well and were really healing for me just to be around them and their families and see what life looks like outside of trauma. And, um, yeah, it was just, college was the best experience for me ever in so many ways. Um, yeah, so I did college, I graduated and I was like, eh, I want to be a teacher, speaker, author. It's not like mm -hmm. you graduate mm -hmm. college and you're that. There's no like, <laughs> right. ad in the paper where you're like, oh yeah, teacher, speaker, I'll do it. There was no ad in the paper. So I thought maybe I'll work with Chamber of Commerce. I don't know. I'm not ready to settle down. And stuff with my mom was still challenging. Even living a state away, it was challenging. Things with my sister and her husband were challenging. And quite honestly, 
invoked physical responses to the stress and the trauma, like anytime for years and years, anytime I thought about going back there, I would get sick and intense fear, like incredible fear. And one thing I forgot to mention is in college, I had incredible fear. Like I would look under my car in the trunk. I'd get home. I'd open the curtain. I'd looked in every closet. I had incredible fear, physical safety fear. And I think it's because I was left alone for at very young ages for days and days and days where I literally could have burnt down the house making supper Yeah, and it didn't happen obviously, but Um, I just, it just, I had a lot of fear. And so, and a lot of fear in making decisions and and doing new things, right? Because it really could mean life or death for me. It was all on me. There was no backup. And so I remember through college, like I was at a wedding, I was about ready to walk into the wedding. My mom calls and she's suicidal. And there's just many calls like that as I'm trying to make my life. There's calls for money. Like, hey, can I need 60 bucks for the phone bill? Bill, I'll pay you back. Or I'm ending my life, you know, or my sister's marriage is like struggling and like they're trying to figure stuff out. And so there was just a lot of stress in that. So when I graduated college, I was like, I want to travel. Mm. <laughs> I want to see what else is out here in the right. world. It's got to be more, right? <laughs> yeah. Like Nebraska feels pretty traumatic for me. So, yeah. yeah. So I found this organization in Georgia and it was a mission trip and they took people all over the world. I went to Jamaica with them. My eyes were just open to other people's suffering. It wasn't just me, you know, and like third world suffering is different and Mm -hmm. it didn't invalidate what I'd been through, but it just... I just knew that I could help. I wanted to serve. I wanted to help. I, I loved it. So I went to Jamaica for two months, just fell in love and went back to Nebraska. And I was like, well, still not ready for that nine to five. And the speaker job still not in the, in the paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I had met some South Africans, um, in, in Georgia and they were like, hey, we're doing this performing arts thing. You should come to South Africa. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, you like more travel? Okay. I know. I know. And we had to raise, it was like a gap year. You had to raise money for it. Um, and they're like, it's 10 grand. And I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. And six weeks later, got on an airplane and flew to South Africa. I didn't even know that South Africa was a country. I didn't know about Nelson Mandela. I didn't know about apartheid. Like, when you are in trauma, you're just trying to make it. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I don't right. remember any of the facts. I'm a good memorizer. I memorize everything for the exams. I got really good grades, but I don't remember any of it. <laughs> like, when Maslow's hierarchy, you know, mm-hmm. it just, those details. So, I didn't know there was white people in South Africa. I didn't even know there was a South Africa. So, I fly there, and all these people, go ahead. Oh, 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 I... I I I have not been to South. I was going to ask you. Um, I, I have not been. To, I have a couple of friends that live there, um, currently, and I, I, I if you, I, I, an exposure that I heard that there's like extreme racism over there. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, that was like, I, it was shocking to me when I learned that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going with your with your experience. No, it's good, and I can talk to about that to you because that was part of my experience as well. But um. Yeah, so I went over there and I loved their culture. And I think part of it was my mom was Austrian. And so I was being raised by an Austrian in America, but with Austrian food, European mindset. You know, my mom always dissed America, like America's so bad. And I always thought, like, why don't you go back then? Oh, why? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so now I'm in this European influenced African country. And they're using words that my mom uses. And I always judged her for it. Like lotion, they call cream. And I was like, ew, don't call it that. And right, right. <laughs> so, that was funny. Yeah. Then I like fell in love with these people. They're the best people. And 
in that time when I was over there in South Africa, it was my first experience with therapy. It was offered as a part of this gap year that I was doing. And wow. I took it up and I cried for two years straight. Yeah. I literally cried for two years straight in therapy and almost every day for two years. And I just, it was almost like the floodgate gates opened. Like I'd been holding it together through this whole time, you know, 23 years and having to make it and just try to fit in. And, and now it was like opening that up and it just wouldn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. That is so beautiful. So pure to have had that experience to allow that out. Yeah. It was incredible. Um, yeah. And go, it go was ahead. part of that culture. Like everybody was in therapy. Like there was a therapist, we were 40 young people on this team that traveled together and there was a therapist and she gave therapy to anyone that wanted it. And I did. And yeah. my girlfriends that I developed in that group were so safe for me to just be me so like powerful. they took me everywhere even if I was a blubbering mess they didn't care they didn't judge me they just brought me with and I I just was in the safety it was like a cocoon for a couple of years for me where wow. I realized how hard it actually was you know like when you're surviving you're just surviving you can't look at how hard it is yeah yeah and so for the first time, looking back and seeing like, oh my gosh, look what you went through. I can, yeah, yeah. I mean, to this day, I think to my, sometimes I, I, you know, just I, sometimes myself, I'll think back to some of the things and I'm like, like, I think like if it's hard to like, what? Like if someone else was telling me that story, I don't even know if I believe it. Um, right. Right. <laughs> like a movie. Like right. a movie. <laughs> Yeah. What, um, out of curiosity, um, just personally, I'm not sure if you said on record for this before we're talking, um, I didn't know 11, but I knew there was several, um, I know you mentioned that there's 11, um, I'm not sure if you said rec what's the label of the word used, but recognized or acknowledged yeah. language in South Africa and that you had learned one of them. Is that correct? And I'm definitely curious, which one did you, um, learn? Yes. so I learned Afrikaans. Okay. Yeah. Um, my husband is Afrikaans and he speaks, that's his native tongue. Um, I'm fluent in it as well. Um, and we actually, after we got married, we moved there and lived there for three years. So the moment that I heard the language, I was like, I want to learn it. I love it. And so that's I just wild. started learning it. And then I ended up marrying an Afrikaans man um, and love the culture and the people. So. That is incredible. And then I believe I'm, I'm asking you because I don't know. It's my, but it's my belief. French is the most fluent spoken language over there, or is that not true? Not in South Africa. Okay. No. Okay. Other African countries, yeah. So the most spoken language, I would think, is probably English, just because okay. there's like nine or ten black languages official. There's more but 10 like African languages and then there's Afrikaans and then there's English. And so English helps the, the African, the black Africans, white Africans to communicate. Okay. Okay. So, cool. Yeah. The, a lot of black Africans, they were forced to learn Afrikaans. So most of them know it, but it's the oppressor's language. So they don't like to speak it. A lot yeah. 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 I can imagine. Oh, but, yeah. I can only imagine. Um, yeah. That is wild that it's hard for me to quantify. So what? But it is hard for me to quantify because of my and I've been in other countries um, for military things. So not not leisurely. Um, I haven't traveled yet. Um, and it's hard for me to quantify like 11 languages going around. Like you I might know. go over here and they just might not speak the language that you speak or you might not speak the language they speak. Yeah. Um, but I do know it is obviously you've had the experience and people that have had it, had it and people that haven't, it is crazy. So I, I through my studies, like I, I do NLP is my big little fun thing. And I know that our words only make up 7% of our communication. And, and with that being said, so there's 93 left outside of our word, 93%. And it's wild how well you can communicate without words. Um, when you don't know the, when you don't know what the words to share. You can just communicate, um, yeah. and it is wild. Um, it we, is. we 
Yeah, we get so in America, I, I'm making a projection. I do. We get so bound up in the words itself and oh man, there's such a tiny part of the communication. Um, and, and evidence is, you know, we literally can communicate without words. Um, I got excited there talking about South Africa. Yeah, no, I love talking about it. You're good. Yeah. Take us back in. So, um, so therapy, so you've had, so, so you just cried your little heart out and had, you, you got to watch the movie and yeah. realize what actually happened at this point in life. And feel it. You don't, you're not taught how to feel growing up. I wasn't, I think some people are, but I wasn't. And so I didn't, I felt it, but I, I suffered through it, but like, I didn't allow myself to feel it in the way that would feel and process and move through it. Right. And so it was like, for the first time, feeling the reality of what I went through, just feeling it and letting it pass through my body. I think, I think these are my projections. I think for everyone listening, when we have traumatic events in childhood, and I'm definitely speaking for self and then projecting a belief for others, it is so intense and we are so unequipped um, and, and we are so magical as energy beings. Um, we, at an unconscious level, dissociate so that we don't have to feel that during that time because we're not equipped to. I just don't think you can make it like in some of that trauma in some of that trauma it's like the brain's way of protecting you bingo really beautiful actually and, and then because we 100 i of like because we were protected and actually didn't feel it and just were a participant of oddly enough <laughs> then there's when we are equipped um then there's an opportunity if we allow ourselves to have that journey to feel it yeah uh, because once we feel it then we can go through it Right. And, and get to that chapter of serving yeah. others. Exactly. What was it like for you? Yeah. So what is the next, what does it kind of look like after, Yeah. after this? Yeah. Yeah. So after that, I got married and I remember the first year of my marriage, because I had only seen broken marriage or yeah, like violent marriage and in my home. And so the first year of marriage, I married this incredible man. He is he's just the best. He's kind and smart and funny and listens to me. I'm a talker. So he listens <laughs> until days and days. And he just was so healing for me. So now I married him. And I remember coming home from work. I was teaching high school in South Africa at the time. And I would come home from work and I'd walk in my own home that I had created. And I thought, I don't have to walk on eggshells. Like, it's safe. Like this is my wow. home. And wow. every day he would get home. And I just remember the energy around my mom and even my sister and her marriage, like they're mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. Like, did I clean the house well enough? Cause my mom was, thought she was German influence. So like everything had to be super clean. I'd get home and the dishes would be on my bed. If I didn't clean them at 10 years old, mm -hmm. like he looked at me. And so he would get home and we just enjoyed each other. And I remember that was always such a surprise the first year, like, whoa, it can be like this. Right, right. And I lived so far from my family. So they would call me, my mom and sister would call me and like, tell me about all the stuff. And I'm just like, wow. So blessed, huh? Like, that's not my life anymore. And I couldn't do anything to help them really because I was so far away. So that was also a protection, like a buffer for me. And so, yeah, that was incredible. So went through marriage, but then marriage is marriage, right? Like it's two humans trying to get together. And yes, I had two years of therapy, but I still had some stuff and so did he. And so then you start kind of having stuff and none of it was like how I grew up, but it was normal stuff. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking like, Ooh, maybe I made a mistake or, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. you think that, and, um, you have these uncertainties and insecurities. Like my mom wasn't able to do it. Maybe I can't either. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, in that time we moved back to the U S and my husband, um, yeah, he actually was in special forces in South Africa, um, which I want to tell you because you have military background. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so that's kind of in him. And right, we right. actually ended up in therapy because of it, like the second oh, time. Oh, sure. Because when we met, we're 22, 23 years old. We're in love. We 
can't keep our hands off each other. We're so into each other. And he's like, just come out of the military. And I told him, look, I grew up without a dad. If you're military, I'm not your girl. Like, I can't do that. I feel like I've been abandoned my whole life. I want a dad for my kids. So peace out. And he's like, no, you. So we got married, but the military is just in him. I don't think yeah. you can ever get it out. <laughs> and so every six months, military would come up, military would come up. And to eventually where I was like, okay, if you go, I can't promise that I'm going to like be here. But at that point we had kids and we really wanted to make it work and we adore each other. We love each other. But, um, so anyway, we ended up in therapy and, um, for that reason. And so we did like marital therapy for a year and a half, two years. And then I kept going on my own. And so that was kind of like the second wave of all my stuff coming out and like stuff that had happened in marriage and those kind of things. And yeah. so, um, and then I just share with my clients and like, Hey, this is what my therapist said, or like, if this can be helpful for you. And I feel like people are always sent where you're like walking parallel to each other in life. Yes. Yes. And so we're just sharing this journey, this journey of life, right. Doing wholeness. And let me tell you what I learned and like validating and um, learning, getting an emotional vocab. That was huge in this yeah. second. Yeah. Like I didn't know how to communicate my heart. I communicated with logic and reasoning and it didn't go well in marriage. Right. <laughs> and so I, I learned a new language of emotional intelligent intelligence and how to feel and what it looks wow. like to process your emotions. And that was the best thing ever wow. to do for my husband and I in our marriage, but also just as a human being. Right. I mean, literally, I'm just over here kind of like in awe. I kind of have like the feels like going on. I'm like, that's just so powerful that you've continued just chapter after chapter, just continued on the spiral. And uh, uh, definitely, I mean, of course, when we um, go that journey, it's just so, so magical. I mean, I'm on the journey. So but when we go that journey, it's just so, so magical. Um, and and I mean, I things were flashing in my head while you're talking about you know, that emotional intelligence and be able to express our emotions and have our emotions. I remember the first time for sure, because it was only like two years ago or so. I remember the first time I used to, you know, I was good with anger. So, you know, if I'm sad, I'm angry. If I'm jealous, I'm angry. If I'm you know angry, I'm angry. <laughs> and, and, um, and so I knew that I would, was, um, I knew that anger was anger was immediately after anger was guilt because I shouldn't do that. Right. And I remember the first time in my life, it was about two years ago that I had got angry and someone said something to me about, you know, well, you're, you know, your attitude or something like that, or you're, you're, I think you're frustrated. And I remember the first time feeling validated and not being explosive and saying like, no, no, I'm more than frustrated. I'm really upset right now. And it was like, so if I remember, like, I, it was an anchor for me. Like, it felt so pure to be like, I'm allowed to be angry. Like, it was so cool for me. Um, forgive me. I, I, I just that 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 popped up to me when you were talking about that, like having that ability to have that emotional intelligence and be able to articulate our emotions and be OK with our emotions. And they're not bad. There's no emotion that's bad. It's just information. It's just information about what's happening and we can listen. It's so beautiful to have emotions. Uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, so now when you have, at this point now, second wave through, through a, I'm going to call it my labels, but second wave of a deep dive because um, you're, you're, you're processing the whole way through, yeah. uh, but these are some deeper ones. Um, what comes after that? Um, after, um, uh, going through this, uh, so, so you've done the, um, doing the marital therapy, um, what are the next, what does the next chapters look like from there? Yeah. So after that, I just enjoyed it and I enjoyed like freedom. Right. And, and I think something that I want to insert in here is as a mom, obviously when I became a mom, I was so hyper vigilant to like create safety for my children. 
And then you're like, oh crap, I'm human. I've got a temper <laughs> and I already messed up. And then you like judge yourself. And so I kind of went through that and um, through this just journey through like, okay, how can I just be sane and not like mess up my kids, but also just be, give myself space to be human. So it's like just figuring out what this looks like, giving myself space to be human. Um, and so through that, this longing of speaking and um, writing a book and helping people, it's always been there, kind of in there. And I've numbed it because I didn't know how, right? And so now I've gone through therapy. I'm helping my hair clients. I'm helping friends. And I really want to do this, but I don't know how. So um, in 2021, we lost my mom in a six-month period. My mom died, my grandmother-in-law, and my mother-in-law. And those, those other two women, grandmother-in-law and mother-in-law, were very dear to me. It was the only grandma I ever knew. My mother-in-law loved me as her own. I adored her and I grieved. I had grieved my mom so many times because of the suicide attempts. I had gone through waves of grief. I had processed um, that. And actually in 2019, I forgot this. I'm, you need to know this. So I looked for my dad, okay? This is part of the therapy. So I started looking for my dad and I found him. Mm. I, yes, we need to know this. I know you do. It's I'm... the best story ever. So I, what do you do? Like, it's been, I think I was 31 at the time. Um, I just had my daughter and, and I found him. A friend of mine is a really good researcher, family friend, and he researched, he called me, he's like, I found him. So how do you like call this dude up? Hey, 32 years ago. Hey, friend. It's you so- daughter. Yeah, it's like unreal. And plus with my mom and every relationship my mom ever had, the men always say she tried to kill them, which she literally did. Um, and so they're terrified of her. Like she's, yeah, she burned a lot of bridges. <laughs> so now here you've got this kid attached to this woman. So I decided I'm going to write a letter first stating who I am, the nature of her, him and my mom's relationship and what I'm looking for and what I'm not. I'm not looking for you to be my daddy. Like I just am looking for the story and medical history at this point. And so I write the letter, no response. I call a few months later and he answers. And I just need to tell you when I go back to LA, I would think like, I'm just gonna walk on Hollywood Boulevard and I know I'm gonna walk past him and we're just gonna know, like we're gonna like, just know yeah, and yeah. fall in love with each other. Like I've had so many dreams. I looked for him when I was 18. I went to LA and looked for him, went to his house where I thought he was like an old address, didn't work, like nothing's worked. So at this point, worked. And um, so he answers, he's super grumpy and he doesn't have time for this. And I say, hey, my name is Shelly Winterbore. I'm conducting family research your name came up, would you be available for questions? Because technically all of that's true. And he's like, mm -hmm. I'm busy right now. Can you call me back? And just real grumpy, short. So I call him back. He doesn't answer. At the time that he said, I call back, he answers. Super, super guarded. Does your mom have a wire? Is she listening in? Does she know my address? Does she know you're talking to me? Like he was terrified of my mom. Mm. So I had to build this relationship with him and be like, no, here was my upbringing. I, it's, you know, not going well for my mom. Like she's not into this at all. She doesn't know I'm not going to tell her. So for six months, built a relationship with this person. Wow. And along the way, I kept thinking like, oh my gosh, I have that. Ooh, I'm good at horseback riding. Oh, I also like to play guitar and like all these similarities and the whole time, like he, this dude is just trying to get to know me. And finally, yeah. after six months, I'm like, okay, listen, it's been six months. Can we take a paternity test? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want my DNA and the system and all the things. Yeah, so yeah. I was just like, peace out. And I just left it. I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And so I left it for six years. 
And after six years, after more therapy, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to call him back. And I called him back and I said, listen, I'm so sorry that I like kind of ghosted you. Because I forgot, um, two months after I'd asked him, he called me back and he said, okay, maybe he did want to do it. But there was some stuff going on. My husband was like, this guy just spoke to this young, pretty woman for six months. And now like he kind of had reservations. So I just left it. So I call him back. I don't know if he's ever going to answer my calls again. He does. I apologize. He was so gracious. He said, I understand this is a unique situation. We really started enjoying each other, took the test and we set it up where it, the results went to him because he's like, I just want to make sure they're not tampered with or anything. Mm -hmm. So one day, it's two days before my 37th birthday, he calls me in just in dire like anxiety. And he's like, I can't believe this. It says 0.0001% and this and that. And how can this be? It can't be. And I couldn't, I didn't know what he was saying. I was like, what are you talking about? And the results were early and the results came back and he wasn't a match. <laughs> and I, both of us were dumbfounded we wanted to be a match we like mm -hmm, developed this relationship mm -hmm, we were mm -hmm. dreaming together and then he wasn't a match the man for 37 years that my mom had told me it was my dad mm -hmm. is not my dad not a, yeah wow. it was devastating i can only imagine devastating this guy loves me i love him i'm in love right like mm -hmm. yeah 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 now and we weren't trying to be like father or daughter. It was just like a friendship that was developing and we had some common suffering around my mom. And so he was ticked. He was like, you need to call your mom and ask her. And my mom at that time wasn't the last 12 years of her life. She was a vagabond, like lived on people's couches and homes without paying rent. And then would get kicked out. It was just very mm -hmm. sad. And, um, so anyway, I called her and I was like, Hey mom, <laughs> hey, I, need, yeah, I, need, I need you to, I want to ask you some hard questions. She's like, okay, honey, whatever. And I asked and she lost her mind. Oh, wow. She was like, how could you do this? You're just digging and uncovering things. And she, oh, how could you? <laughs> how could I? I'm so selfish. Called me a lot of names and said a lot of really painful things to me and um, hung up the phone and went to bed. And I woke up to five pages of I'm selfish. I'm this, I'm that, I'm you know, ruining everything and all this stuff and never contact her again, which is not the first time that she has asked me not to <laughs> um, contact her. But at that point, I had decided my therapist had been telling me for a year and a half, he's like, you know, you don't have to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. And that just was mind blowing to me. Like, no, but it's my mom. I do. I owe her. Mm -hmm. She tried. She wanted to come and live with me. And I said, no. And she cut me out of her life for four months because I chose my marriage and my children. Mm -hmm. And I just knew like my mom used my social security number when I was 12 to get a credit card. Like mm -hmm. I can't trust, like it just, you know, so that was painful to say no to my mom knowing she needed help. But anyway, so when she said never contact me again, I was just like, you know what? Even if my own husband spoke to me the way that she's speaking to me, I'd be out. Mm. Nobody, I allow my mom to speak to me like this because oh, wow. it's my mom. And she's my only genetic, you know, heritage. And I love her, but it is hurting me. Every time I'm in communication with her, it takes me about a month to rein it back in. And that keeps me out of the presence of this life that I've created with this beautiful man and children that I adore. Yeah. You know, this healthy life that I've, I've managed to create. And so I just decided I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing this. It is not selfish to want to know about my father. Right. You know, it's right. not. And it was the first time, I think there were a series of steps working up to it, but it was really the first time that I stood up to my mom and said, no, 
and she lost it. It was, she called my sister, my sister's calling me. She's like, what'd you do? And I'm just like, mm. I called my mom on her BS. I called mom on BS and I'm asking for the truth because most of this has been a lie, right? Yeah, yeah. I just want to know. And so, yeah, we were estranged for a year and a half. And my sister kept calling, wanting to peacemake, like, can you just call mom? I'm like, no, I'm not. It's not, it's not okay for me to do that. I just need this boundary. Beautiful. And, um, yeah. My sister called me uh, end of 2020 and said, it's bad. It's real. Cause my mom had faked, faked brain cancer. She'd use my nephew when she didn't want to pay bills. She's like, Oh, my, my, my grandson has cancer. I can't pay the bill because I'm paying his bills. Like lots of lies. And so we never knew if she's in the hospital, if it was real, like, is this it? Or is she really sick? Cause we faked a stroke. We faked cancer. We faked paralysis, like lots of things. And so my sister called me, she's like, it's for real. Will you just call her? And I called my mom after a year and a half. And I just kept saying, she was so incoherent. I just kept saying, I love you. I love you. I just want you to know I love you. And she made it through that and lived six more weeks. And in those six weeks, we were able to reconcile in the way that she could. It mm -hmm, wasn't, mm -hmm. you know. But at that mm -hmm. point, there was no need for a boundary because mm -hmm. It was the end of life. And you so were just I, sharing your energy with her. And so, so, so powerful and beautiful on your part. Keep going. I was so grateful to have that moment because the whole year and a half that I was estranged from her, I kept asking myself, will I regret this? Like, mm -hmm. if, she dies, mm -hmm. if she dies, will I regret it? And I, I hoped not, but I just decided I'm fighting. I'm standing up for me and I'm standing up for my kids that they see, and they would ask, mommy, why don't we see grandma Michelle? And I just told them like, you know, grandma Michelle has a sickness in her brain and it makes her not be nice sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they got it, you know? And so anyway, the last six weeks, her and I communicated, we reconciled and I feel like that was the greatest gift I didn't, I wasn't owed that. I didn't deserve that, but I had it and I'm so grateful. And the first conversation when she was coherent, she's like, honey, I'm so sorry. I just didn't know what to do. And there was this guy, he was a neighbor, cousin's neighbor. His name's this, he's from Israel. Work him up. Like, I think it could be him. And she was so kind. She said, sorry, I feel emotional. She said, mm. he was so kind. And and you're so much like him. I think you would love him. And it was just neat that she had good memories of him and that, mm. you know, cause she said some, she said some of the best things and some of the worst things to me <laughs> in my life. And she was so gentle in that moment. And so, yeah, she passed a few weeks later and I've not found the guy he's, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done all the ancestry stuff, can't find them. And I've come to a place where I'm like, okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. where I was going with this about 10 minutes ago, end of 2021, we had a lot of grief and loss. And I grieved the whole year of 2021, the loss of these women. And December 2021, I was like vegging out, watching Netflix and just kind of numbing out. And I was like, Shelly, you're turning 40 next year. You have this dream in your heart. You have a story. You can help people. What are you doing? Like, get, mm. come on, let's do this. So I hired a life coach. And Greg, this, out of all the words today, here it is. In coaching, I changed from victim to empowerment. Something didn't click for me in therapy. I stayed the victim. This is my victim story. Listen to me. I need you to validate me. In coaching, I quickly, like in a couple of weeks, went from this is who I am, this victim. I'm always kind of behind because of what I went through to I decide who I am and I'm no longer a victim. 
I made this, I made it through and I get to decide from here on out how this goes, how I, who I want to be, who I am, how I want to handle myself and the confidence just exchanging the victim mentality. Even though I had been through therapy, I'm a great mom. I have a successful marriage, successful business. I still in deep inside was the victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is so powerful. Go ahead. Good. Yeah. And, and it really just was accepting how I made that transformation was accepting who I was, all of me, all of me. Yes, I'm selfish. Yes, I can be moody and very direct and hurt feelings. And I'm incredibly genuine and creative, inspiring and an excellent mom. Like I'm all of it. And I no longer had to hide from my past and where I came from and poor choices that I made as an adult, not blaming anything on my mom. I made my own choices, right? Yeah. And some poor choices that I made, but like, I'm enough. I just decided I'm enough. I'm worthy because I am not because of who I married or how much money I make or my past or my upbringing. Like I'm enough today, right now. Yes, I'm selfish. Yes, I'm smart. You know, all the things like I'm yeah. all of it. I get yeah. to be all of it. There's space for me in this world to be me. I'm not a problem. I don't need to go and look for normal anymore. I am normal. Like who I am is normal and weird all at the same time, right? It's beautiful. Like, and when I started, I just went through a process where I owned it. I was like, this is who I am. I'm okay. I got this. Let's go. That's right. That's right. I, I, that is so, everything you just said. I mean, absolutely beautiful. That's the, the gift of like the very moment. Um, if, if I, you know, project for everyone when we, when we, once we step out of that victim, when, when I became, I, I would say, so um, I lived as a victim for, um, for a solid, solid 27 years and then began the shift. And then that was still a, a process. Um, but literally now I understand um, all the things that I've experienced are my gifts. Yes. Uh, okay, because of the way I can communicate. Okay, because of the way I empathize. But oh yeah, they're literally the platform in which I share. And, and, and then realizing, I, I heard it said one time as saying that, and it made me think of it when you're talking about this, uh, to, to, to really love ourselves, we must love all the parts that made who we are because that's who we are. And some of those parts weren't really pretty. And so to truly love ourselves is really being able to love the parts that weren't pretty. And I can love my childhood. And I said, love my childhood because it will allow me to serve millions during my time on this earth. So without it, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I love my childhood. I would never want anyone else to go through it, but man, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I heard all that from you. And this is so, so powerful when we make that shift out of, we're not less than because of what happened. And literally everyone listen, if, if you haven't, if, if you're, if you haven't made that shift yet, I want to empower you with the words and share that. Okay, you're not less than. I think it's also important to share with you when you accept and love these, you are literally more than. Um, I felt that's called to share that. That's yes, that's all we need is to accept and love ourselves, like that internal validation. And so once, oh, good, good. No, I was just gonna say, I think that's what we're looking for. Like, even if you don't have a traumatic upbringing, that's what we're looking for, right? Like, am I enough? Am I okay? Mm. That's, that's the human condition, right? Mm. And we're just wanting to know. And I had that from God all those years, but it wasn't until I decided. Mm -hmm. I kind of like used him as a crutch. To mm -hmm. him. Good. And then once it was great, it's exactly what I needed when I needed it. But when I decided, when I looked at me, I'm as naked in the mirror, if you will, and said, you're enough. And if we're going with a physical thing, like those dimples, those sags, those wrinkles, right? But emotionally, like 
it's all beautiful. It all makes mm. up who I am. Mm. Powerful. So once, once you, I'm going to, I'm going to make an assumption here. Once you got to this place, um, I'm going to assume you began serving others. Yes. Well, yeah. and okay. Okay. Let me say this. Cause I already know a little bit. Um, well, I would have guessed it anyway, but you've already shared with me. So now share with me a little bit around how you started to create organization with how you were serving others. I, you have already shared with me. I'm not sure if it was during the record, just right before. And, and, and we, all of us that have had the simulate something, which how we know you were serving people the whole time. Right. Um, how did, what did it look like when you began to say, oh, wow, I'm worthy and I'm capable and I want to create some organization and, and really um, intentionally start serving people. What does that look like? What did that look like in that transition? And what does it look like now? Yeah. So I signed up for an email. I did Shelly Winterbor at gmail.com. And I was like, email me. I'm going to send this out. This is my business email. That's like the first step I took. And I remember feeling scared. It felt like such a big deal. Now looking back, it's it's funny. but for me, that was just saying like, I am going to serve in this capacity and the vehicle is coaching. And so I'm open for business. I want to coach everyone and anyone that needs help. Like mm -hmm. anyone that feels like a victim feels like they can't go on. That's how I want to do it. So I started telling my hair clients about it. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to start coaching soon. And they're like, can I do it with you? I've just seen the change in you. I'm like, yes. And so, you know, I started with six weeks and like, let's see if I'm even good at this in this capacity. And I was really impactful. And so I just started offering six month coaching packages where I walk you through like mind management, managing your thoughts. Cause that's also part of it is like, I believe for so long that I wasn't supposed to be here that I'm abandoned, I'm not worthy of time. And so that was thoughts that I believed. So I help my clients walk through their thoughts and managing those thoughts and seeing what their thoughts are creating in their life. And then also processing emotion. Um, I do that with them is like, how do you feel? What is a feeling? Let's give words to this. And then how do we actually process when you're having an emotion right now, how do you process it through your body? So it moves on through, right? Mm. And then taking action, starting to take action. So um, I created Shelly Winterboer Coaching LLC. And um, I kind of do a little bit of everything. If people mm. are like, hey, you coach. I'm like, I just love variety. So I'm coaching entrepreneurs. I'm doing fashion coaching because if it's in my blood from my mom, like I just love fashion. And so I do that. I created workshops. I'm speaking at different events. Right now I'm speaking at a nonprofit, which is um, a homeless. It's, it's like an intervention and getting on your feet. And I'll tell you what, Greg, I walked in there and there was this 10 year old and she reminded me so much of me. She even looks like me. And she asked a question that was like, okay, I hear that you're saying you can start and write a new page in your life. But when things feel hard and there's finances, then what? When you feel discouraged, a 10 year old asking you that. I was just mm. like, dang, I am speaking to this girl. Like, here's my microphone because I wish somebody had said it to me. Like, you're mm. enough. You're okay. You're going to make it. You can make wow. it. Um, so, the vehicle that I use is Shelly Winterboard Coaching. Um, I'm starting a podcast this fall because uh, obviously I like to talk. <laughs> And I just yeah. want to share. I want to share with people. I want people to know that they're not alone. There's so many people like you and I that have gone through hard things and that's remained the victim their whole life. You know, I've coached some 60 year olds that are still a victim from what mm -hmm. happened in their twenties and they're teenagers yeah. and there's freedom, there's life. So it's powerful. And, and, and it really, I love it. You said like, like depending, I, I, I tell people like, we're blessed enough if we get to go this journey during our, during our time on this earth. Um, some of us um, won't go the journey at all. Um, for those for those that are listening that have connected with your energy, um, I, 
those that are listening and connected with you, they under, they understand what your coaching is. It's it, 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 and, and I'm going to suggest um, and and correct me in any way, or or align it in any way. Your coaching is about. It, I, I like how you talked about helping people organize their thoughts. I'm using my labels, process their emotions and realize they're enough. Because when you do those three things, nothing else is going to matter. Everything's going to fall into place. It doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a hairdresser, or whatever the case may be. When we are our thoughts and, and uh, keeping this fairly surface level, our thoughts, most people, some people will realize, some people don't realize there's a book called Untethered Soul. And it really helped me realize this. And it was really powerful. Our, if we stop and just listen to our thoughts for like 30 seconds, it'll probably freak us out. Try five minutes. By the way, they're going on nonstop all the time. Yeah. Our thoughts, our mind is like a neurotic child, just like rambling, like nonstop. Are oh, they going to like my shirt that I close the garage? Do I have to pay that bill? Do I have to do I wonder what they thought. Do I have to get, and you're like, it is not, it just won't be quiet. And then the realization is that um, we can then begin to, there's a process obviously of, of, slowly but surely programming that neurotic child into this like little empowering child that's constantly speaking empowering things to you for the people that connect it with you today for the people that might have more questions for your or the people that are like hey i'm ready for coaching or i'm in coaching and i want to connect with her energy I constantly work with a coach myself constantly. And I, and I, and I sh sometimes I'll be with a coach for a longer period of time. And when I switch coaches, it's just, I'm ready for a different energy in that chapter. Um, so maybe someone's already working with a coach and they're looking for your energy or just kind of starting the coaching journey. Where do they go to connect with you? Yeah. Uh, Shelly Winterbor at gmail.com. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Um, you can find me on social, Shelly Winterbore Coaching. It's W-I-N-T-E-R-B-O-E-R. -E um, Beautiful. And those, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Shelly. Good. Yeah. Uh, those, so those of you listening in on this, uh, listening on the audio, you can check us out video on YouTube, the channel Success After Trauma. And we're going to have those links posted there um, so that you can connect with Shelly, um, reach out and email Shelly. Uh, and if you're watching us on video, you can download us on your favorite podcast streaming platform so you can listen to us on the go. Shelly, I appreciate getting to have you on here. And I would, if you're open to, um, we'll schedule again, we'll bring you on again. I just love your energy. It is very, very clear that you've done the work. Uh, I say done the work. Um, we're all, if we choose, if we're lucky enough, if we're blessed enough, we'll begin this journey. For those of us that have begun the journey, we're all somewhere on the journey. And if you're day one or day 1000, you're on the journey. I, I, right? I don't know the day number, but it is very clear to me um, that you have done self work. And, and prior, when we begin the journey, I'm going to suggest like the journey may have began with the first therapy for you. I, you know, who am I to quantify it? But when we begin the journey, we begin with self. And somewhere, I think most of us on the journey loop back and say, oh, there's still people left. I got to go back. I got to go back. Uh, it is clear that you've done the personal work. You know, and again, I, you know, maybe you, I would assume probably still on that journey, but it, it's clear a lot of work has been done. And that's what um, I can tell and feel congruency in, in the energy that you're going to be able to share with other people because of the experiences you've had with self. Um, I appreciate what you've done. And hmm, um, give me one second. Let me think about this. I, uh, I, Um, I am grateful that you had the strength to be here. I, I earlier I had said, and, and I said it out of like a knee jerk response, and I, I do my best to not say this. And I said it earlier was, man, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. I'm not. It's a blessing. I'm grateful that you made it through each chapter and you're here today to share your energy back with everyone. Um, can I ask you before we leave, I, I asked guests um, to kind of just, um, I'll, I'm going to give you something and just have you channel and share your last message, our last words, if you will, our final thoughts. And so if you would share a message with, um, and whenever I, I ask this of the guest, and whenever I ask it, I like right now, I don't know what I'm about to ask of you, just kind of whatever comes to me. 
Um, would you share a message with, let's say, someone? Would you share a message, uh, man, woman, um, but someone that has begun to see that there's more, but has not actually began the journey? Would you share a message, whatever you're called to share, with that person? Um, that's kind of sitting on the fence and they just had the realization that there is a journey and now they're like, uh, would you share some words with them? I love that question. Um, in that moment, when you are seeing that there's more, it feels terrifying, overwhelming, and a bit exciting. And standing on, you know, in the journey, maybe a little bit further than where you're at in the journey, it is 100% worth it. It is the way to live your life. If we're going to be here anyway, <laughs> I'd say jump, like let's do it. It is so worth it because we are created in a way that is so unique, so beautiful, deep and complex, incredible and you're worth finding that for, right? You're worth doing the work to just discover who you are and what lights you up and, and what you love and what you don't. And just feeling alive in this, this human body suit, so worth it. So I would just say, I know it's scary and it feels like a lot, but it can also be, there's a bit of fun in it too, just discovering. There's a ton of fun in it. Yeah. Thank you, Shelly, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your energy. And everyone listening in, again, you can uh, download us on your favorite podcast streaming platform. If you're listening to the audio, you can check us out on video. We're on YouTube and the channel is Success After Trauma. Until the next episode, be great. It's already in you. Mm -hmm.